I have to admit, the book of Ephesians took me by surprise. As I was doing my own sort of personal reading over the last couple of months at the end of last year, I'm reading different books of the Bible and so on and so forth. I start going through Ephesians, and just all of the lights started turning on. It surprised me how this book grabbed me. It became clear to me that it's going to be important for us as a church now to walk through this book together. So I'm excited about what we're going to kind of see as we unfold this wonderful book. Now, Ephesians, if you begin to read about it or those who've commented or written about it, Ephesians is often considered to be one of the richest books in the New Testament, especially early on in the life of the church. As church fathers and mothers would write about this book, they actually considered it to be kind of the crown jewel of Paul's epistles. The theology here is is beautiful, it's profound, it's dense. The things that Paul has to tell us about who God is, about what God has done for us, about the role that Jesus Christ plays, about what salvation looks like. And we, we are entered into relationship with God by grace through faith because of the work of Christ. It's absolutely beautiful. And then it's full of astounding application. This book is not just about the things of God. So we get to learn about God. We, 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 we talk about who God is, and we, we think wonderful thoughts about God. It's not just that, but all of those things are going to have profound implication in the lives of believers. And it changes astounding things, surprising things as we unfold this book, what God will change as we live out his life. We also learn that God's power is at work warring against our enemy. Now the end of the book finishes with this incredible passage of scripture that some of your Bibles just simply label the armor of God and we consider that passage about spiritual warfare and that's true but there's a case to be made that this entire book is about that. What God is doing to display his power in this world and to our spiritual enemy. What God does is powerful and beautiful. Jesus Christ is the ultimate victor, Lord of history, Alpha and Omega. And in the meantime, the church of Jesus Christ is living in the victory of Christ. And what does that mean for us? You see, there's a lot for us to learn in this book, both about who God is and what it means to live this life with Him. Now, the city of Ephesus, let's talk about this briefly. And as we go through the book, we'll learn more about the city itself and Paul's time there and the character of the church that got built in this city. But the city of Ephesus itself was actually very important to Paul, his missionary team, and to the life of the New Testament church. Now, it turns out that Paul himself spent somewhere between two and three years in the city of Ephesus. You can go back and you can read that story in the book of Acts, chapters 19 and 20, kind of give us that range and what happens there with Paul in Ephesus. But what happens is this. Paul spends quite a bit of time in the city of Ephesus, and while he is there, he not only strengthens and builds the church that is in that city, but he also uses it as a kind of home base. And he'll travel from there to the smaller cities in the countryside around Ephesus. In Acts 19 and 20, it actually tells us that while Paul was in Ephesus, all of the cities in the countryside heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Ephesus is sort of a hub city, a metropolitan city, and it becomes this powerful and dynamic church in the life of the early church in the New Testament believers. Eventually, the disciple John himself, the author of the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the receiver of the book of Revelation, he finishes his life as a pastor, as an elder inside of the city of Ephesus. Jesus himself writes the city of Ephesus a letter that happens in Revelation chapter 2. And in that letter, Jesus encourages that church to not forget two things, your first love and the truth that saved you. Don't forget the love that you gathered for me and for the gospel and for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And don't let go of the truth of the gospel. Love and truth will play powerful, dynamic roles inside of the book of Ephesians. The church there in that city was strong, and it endured for a long time. And this group of Christians has a lot to teach us about what it means to live for Jesus Christ. 
So I'm going to be honest with you from the very beginning. I'm praying for us. I'm going to ask you guys to pray with me about this, that this will be a genuine journey of transformation for every one of us as we draw closer and closer to Jesus Christ. So here's some of what we're going to do this morning. First of all, we're going to talk about the theme of the series, the mystery of the gospel. What on earth does that mean? Why is that phrase important to us? Why is it important to Paul? So we'll talk about the mystery of the gospel and how Paul means that. And then we're also going to talk about how Paul speaks of Christians. Who Paul thinks you are if you follow Jesus Christ. Who are we? What has God done for us? And Paul's going to jump immediately into those thoughts right at the beginning of this letter. So let's begin reading. And uh, some of you are going to laugh when I say this, but we are this morning going to get all the way through verse 3 of chapter (laughs) 1. I am not kidding. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you, And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. This actually opens up one of the more longer and complex introductions in the New Testament. Almost all of Paul's letters follow a very similar pattern. Paul greets a church or a group of churches, and he opens up with an introduction of what he's going to talk about, a prayer to the church and so forth. And the one that's in Ephesians is actually the longest and most complex. Verses 3 through 14 are one long sentence. Many of your translations will actually maintain that, and you'll notice as you read through those verses, your brain doesn't take a break because there may not be periods in your translation. Paul has a lot to cram in here at the very beginning of this book. And he's going to deal not with everything that he touches on the book, but a lot of the big ideas of what he's going to unfold later on in this chapter. And as you read through those first 14 verses... I think you will find that your your brain just gets full of thoughts and concepts and ideas because, man, Paul is just loading it all in here at the very beginning, and then he will unfold all of this as the book moves on. But the introduction itself is incredible. Paul introduces himself. He calls himself an apostle by the will of God. That's actually important for Paul, for the Ephesians, and for us. He greets the Christians, and he calls them saints. What does he mean by that when he calls them saints? When he's referring to all of us as followers of Jesus Christ as saints. He calls them faithful in Christ Jesus. So he's introducing not just himself, but those who follow Jesus Christ and what's important about us in our relationship with Christ. And then he begins very quickly to talk about what God our Father has done for us in Jesus Christ. But as we begin to unfold some of this, I want to spend some time talking about the theme of our series, the mystery of the gospel. Why is that phrase important? What do we mean by that? What does Paul mean by that? Well, Paul actually uses the word mystery a lot. He uses it a lot in several of his letters. He uses it a lot in the book of Ephesians. And every time he uses that term, he's speaking roughly of the same kind of thing. So here are all the places in this book where Paul talks about the mystery of, where he talks about what this means. Chapter 1, verse 9. In fact, at the very beginning of the book, mystery is important. At the end of the book, mystery is important. So Paul doesn't drop the idea. It actually bookends his book of Ephesians. In chapter 1, verse 9, he talks about the mystery of his will, of God's will, the mystery of God's will. In chapter 3, verse 3, he's telling the Ephesians, he says, Now you know that I have been entrusted with something. God has given me stewardship of the mystery of his grace to make sure that it is spoken to and explained to you, to Gentiles, and everywhere that I go. 
I've been entrusted with the mystery of the grace of God. The next verse, he actually calls it the mystery of Christ. In chapter 3, verse 9, we're going to read three verses 9 and 10 later on. It's an astounding pair of verses, but he talks about the mystery of God's plan, what God is doing. It's a, it's a mystery. In chapter 5, verse 32, Paul finishes his conversation about husbands and wives by saying this. Now, what I'm really talking about is that this is the mystery of Christ and his church. Now, be honest with me. When you learned that we were going to do the book of Ephesians this morning, how many of you immediately thought of the verse, wives submit to your husbands? Go ahead and raise your hands, right? All right, so that's not all that's in the book of Ephesians. There's a lot more. And Paul finishes his conversations about husbands and wives and families by saying, now what we're really talking about is the mystery of Christ and his church. And then in chapter 6, verse 19, before he closes the book, He appeals to the Ephesians. He appeals to Christians. And he says, here's what I need from you. I need you to pray for me, that I am full of courage so that everywhere I go, I can speak the mystery of the gospel. I need you to pray for me so that I can do this well, so I can do this with boldness and with courage. Now, we've used this word a lot. Paul uses it a lot. When you and I... Think of using the word mystery. It generally has a kind of fuzzy, around-the-edges, negative connotation. If we use that word on a daily basis, it's usually something like, well, that's just a mystery to me. And what it tends to mean is, well, I might understand a little bit of it, but I really don't understand it. It might even mean it's not understandable. It's full of contradictions. And in the end, it's a mystery. And we just sort of brush it aside and say, well, we don't understand it. We can't understand it. That tends to be the way that you and I use the word mystery. Paul does not use it like that at all. The New Testament doesn't use that word mystery like this at all. So here's what Paul means when he speaks of mysteries. We read it through this book. We deal with it on Sundays. Here's what we mean by mystery. Mystery in the New Testament, what the word means is something that was once hidden or was partially known that God is now revealing and making known. So the Old Testament sees in part. It will foresee the life of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It will foresee the kingdom of God. It will foresee the church and the family of God, but it sees a piece of it. So what was not known or partially known in the life of Jesus Christ, and this is amazing in the book of Ephesians, it's not just the life of Jesus Christ, but in the life of the church itself, God is revealing now his plan. So it's not something unknowable, It is something that God is making known. Now, a wonderful Christian author by the name of G.K. Chesterton, he wrote a lot of stuff. But some of the things that he wrote were mystery novels, the Father Brown Mysteries. And G.K. Chesterton is a very thoughtful and fascinating guy to read. But he wrote about what the New Testament means by mystery. And he said, what the New Testament means by mystery actually is very much like this. A mystery is something that is revealed in the end, like a very good mystery novel or detective novel. But more than that, it's revealed in the end, but when it is revealed, it makes sense of the rest of the story. Heather and I enjoy writing, reading, I I would enjoy to write, but I don't, (laughs) enjoy reading good mystery novels and detective novels. And when it's really good, right, you're working your way through the situation, you're watching it all unfold. In the back of your mind, you're trying to figure out who done it, how did this happen. And when the mystery is finally revealed at the end, if it is well written, all of a sudden the rest of the book makes sense. You go, oh, that's, oh, that's why that happened. Oh, that's who that was. I didn't know that. Now I see that. So it's not just something that is revealed, but when it is revealed, it makes sense of the rest of the story. Now get this, guys. The mystery of Christ, of the church, of the gospel, is something that God is now revealing that pulls his whole story together, makes sense of the whole story, makes sense of everything from Genesis 
to revelation. As God reveals it, unfolds it, the light bulbs start to go on and the rest of it begins to make sense. So get this, guys. A faithful church makes sense of God. A faithful church will make sense of God to the rest of the world. And Ephesians is going to say this is actually what God is doing in the church. He's unfolding his will so that all will see and know. It's beautiful what happens. So we get the sense of the revealing of a mystery that makes sense of the rest of the story as it is unfolded. There's another author. His name is Jonathan Meriden, a little book that he wrote called um, Learning How to Speak God from Scratch. And he has this little chapter on mystery. He and others describe mystery as this, something that is infinitely knowable. You, you know what? I'm going to go back and read a verse of Scripture talking about the unfolding of mystery. Before we get to it being infinitely knowable, I want to read Ephesians 3, verses 9 and 10. Listen to this. And to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God. Notice all of that revelation language. Bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Now get this. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. God is using the church to reveal his complete, absolute, glorious, beautiful, his manifold will to everyone, including, did you notice this, to the authorities and the powers that are in the heavens. He's revealing to the spiritual realm his will through you and me, which is absolutely astonishing. Now I want to talk about this sense of mystery and the sense of something that is being, that is infinitely knowable. Now, that may feel a little bit like a paradox to us. It may not make much sense when we first think about it, but something that is infinitely knowable, uh, it's, it's just this is a really cool thought. Now, we might immediately think that, well, if I know something, I just know it. I've just got it. If I don't know it, I learn something, and then I've got it, and I know it. What else is there to know? But the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of Christ, the mystery of God's will is something that continues to unfold and is infinitely knowable. Now, this is the testimony of Scripture. This is the testimony of people who've walked with Christ for a very long time. And I can tell you at least a little bit this is true in my life as well. The more we know about God, the more we know there is so much more to know. Okay? The more we know about God, the more we know there's so much more to know. It's like walking from the shoreline into the ocean. It just gets deeper and deeper and grander and grander and more complex and more incredible and more amazing the further and further and further we go. This is what it means to unfold the mystery of the gospel. Now, the things that we learn about God are true, and they're always true. So when we learn things like God is love, this is true about God. This is true about his nature. This is true about how he interacts with us. And we know that, and we learn that, and sometimes we learn that very, on and very early on inside of our faith. But the longer we walk with God, we don't just learn that God is love. We learn that God is love, right? The more we know about him, he doesn't cease to be love. He becomes greater and greater in that capacity in what he actually does. This concept is in Ephesians as well. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17, 18, and 19 say this. So that Christ, this is part of Paul's prayer for the church. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend. Now notice this knowledge language. That you may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth? And get this, get this phrase. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Did you catch that? That you may be filled with the fullness of God. I want you to comprehend this. I want you to know the love of Christ that in fact surpasses our knowledge. There's something to grow in, in the love of Christ constantly for the rest of our lives. It is infinitely 
unknowable, this mystery of Jesus Christ. And so now as the book unfolds, we discover that we are actually now involved in living in this mystery, living this out, being a part of God's plan and how he unfolds all of this to the rest of the world, the growing understanding of how much more the gospel of Jesus Christ changes things in our lives, the lives of those around us, and by the grace of God, even in the broader culture around us, how much the things of God can change things. So Ephesians really is about transformed lives. It's about this living and breathing powerful, powerful God who is at work doing things. We do not believe in a God who wound up the universe, let it go, and has no longer paid any attention to it whatsoever. Just this mechanistic universe. He exists, but he's disconnected. It's not the God we believe in. It's not the God of the book of Ephesians. God is involved. God is at work. He's unfolding his will in the lives of his people. And we can actually become a part of that. There's a very simple sort of outline to the book of Ephesians. It sort of can fit into two pieces. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are about God and who he is and what he has done and, and how it's affecting things. Then chapters 4, 5, and 6 are all about, now here's how you should live because all of this is true. Right? So this is true about God, and this becomes true about our lives as well. And we've talked about this notion that Christ is the victor. If you read commentaries or study Bibles about the book of Ephesians, you might even run across a phrase that's often used about this book in the sister book, Colossians. Christ is the cosmic victor. It's an interesting phrase, but it just simply means that in the end, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. All of history, every atom and molecule of creation is going to be gathered in Christ, and he is Lord of all. So Christ is the victor, capital V, victor. And now the church is living in his victory. And there are some things in this book that Paul says exist in the church, are at work inside of the church, that are radically different from what's at work outside of the church. They've come out of a very different kind of lifestyle into Jesus Christ, and now things are different. Here are some of the, 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 the big ones that happen in the book of Ephesians about what that's at work here now inside of the church that's different than the rest of the world. Paul is going to tell us, and he's going to tell us early on in this book, that there is an uncommon unity amongst the people of God, a shocking uncommon unity. There should be. There is in Christ a uh, unity, and we should be living into that. Now, early on in chapter 2, Paul is going to go straight for one of the most divisive and controversial issues in his world, which turns out to also be one of the most controversial and divisive issues in our culture as well. He says, I don't care what ethnic background you came from. Here, we are one in Christ. Every ethnic background, every economic difference doesn't matter here in the church of Jesus Christ. He's going to go straight for what in their world were deeply dysfunctional and deeply violent and dangerous relationships between men and women, husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and servants, and he's going to say here, none of that exists. There's an uncommon unity inside of the church that doesn't exist outside of it. Our current culture is obsessed with our differences. It's obsessed with what makes you different from everyone else. Now, there's nothing wrong with paying attention to our differences, but here's what our culture does with our differences. It takes our differences and turns them into hatred and envy. This is what our culture does with our differences now. What the church does with them is says we recognize all those differences, but here, come here. We're going to embrace you in Jesus Christ as an equal. The church does something unique, guys. Here's part of what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. So then, and he's speaking to people who have become a part of the family of God. You are no longer strangers and aliens. 
But you now are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. You were once kept at arm's length from the people of God, but now because of the church and the work of Jesus Christ, we're opening the door and we're pulling you in. It's beautiful what Paul does. There's an uncommon unity that is at work inside of the church that is not at work outside of the church. It is also the case in this book that the truth is at work here. The truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth of who God is and how he built things and how he made us to relate to each other and to him is at work inside of the church, and it creates health. The truth is simply how we get hold of reality and make sense of things. If we let go of the notion of truth itself, we are actually, without maybe realizing it, letting go of reality and making sense of things. But the truth is actually at work inside of the body of Christ. Here again is part of what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. He's talking about how God has put the church together, and he says this, God has given gifts to the church so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. We would quit believing what is false no matter how good it looks. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, that is Christ. Living a life run by falsehood, he actually calls a certain kind of childishness. He said, but God has given gifts to the church and put us together so that what is operative here is truth spoken in love. And when that happens, we actually grow up. We mature. We grab hold of reality. We treat each other the way Christ wants us treated. The truth is at work here, and it does powerful thing. And then the divine power of Jesus Christ is at work. What we do in the church is not a lecture series on the book of Ephesians with a few cool songs put on either end. That's not what we do here. This is not some sort of public university that you can come to for free and just enjoy what I, quite frankly, think is an awesome lecture, right? And go home and forget all that. I'm, just, I'm kidding. You guys, you guys got to know my sense of humor. If you don't know it now, you'll learn it eventually. That's not what this is. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit is at work. The divine power of Jesus Christ is literally here at work inside of his church. Here's part of what Paul says about that later on in the book, Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. This is available to us. So are we ready as we read through this book, as we make sense of what Paul is talking about, are we ready to actually see our lives as things that are charged with the unity and the truth and the power of the Holy Spirit? Are we ready to see our day-to-day lives actually like that? Or will we live like practical atheists and lay all of that aside and live as if those are just ideas, false or true, doesn't matter? Or are we ready to live as people who are part of the unfolding of the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Who are we as followers of Christ? Let's go back and read verses, verse 1 and 2 of Ephesians 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The author of this letter calls himself, Paul calls himself an apostle. This is an important word in the New Testament. It is actually a pretty specific designation. An apostle is someone who is called to herald of the gospel, to speak of the good news everywhere that they go. In the New Testament especially, it means someone who is actually called by Christ, sent by Christ to do that. The original disciples, the broader ring of disciples around them, sent by Christ himself, 
Paul in his conversion experience. He said, I've become apostle even though I was late born to all of this. I've become an apostle. So Paul sees his job as speaking the gospel of Christ as clearly as he can to as many people as he possibly can. So this becomes Paul's life. Moving from city to city to city, establishing churches, strengthening churches, establishing elders and pastors and leadership and writing back to them, this becomes his job. I am an apostle of Christ Jesus, he says, by the will of God. It's a very simple phrase, but it has always struck me. 20 years ago, when I really started paying attention to these things and reading through these things, that phrase that Paul uses many times has always stopped me. Paul says, this isn't, this isn't me. This is what God wants. The will of God means this happens by divine desire. God's called me to do this. So when Paul speaks, he doesn't speak of his own authority, and he'll say this kind of thing a lot. I'm not speaking of my own authority. I am speaking with God's authority because God has decided to do this with my life. Who am I? Who are we? by divine desire, by God's will, what He wants at work inside of our lives. So this drives Paul. This motivates Paul. This is Paul's appeal as to the authority that God has given him. Here's part of what Paul says, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. We learn in this book that Paul writes the book of Ephesians while he is in prison. So he says this, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord. And he means that both literally and metaphorically. He literally is a prisoner because of the cause of Christ, and he is bound by the will of God to speak the gospel. I'm a prisoner to this, right? A prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So this is Paul. This is who he is. This is, this is who he describes himself as. And then he begins to speak to the church. He says, I'm talking to the saints who are in this city. I'm talking to the saints who are in this region. Many of the early copies of the book of Ephesians uh, don't have that little phrase to the saints who are in Ephesus. It doesn't use that little word in Ephesus. So what's, what's likely the case is this, is that this book did what Paul did when Paul was in Ephesus. So the book was written to be read to the church in Ephesus and then go from Ephesus then to this church, and then to this church, then to this church, and this church. So it's a circular letter. And in Ephesus acts as its home base. That's how it comes to us, but it's intended for a bunch of churches, which is just beautiful. But he's speaking to saints. Now, New Testament saints are not perfect, perfected people. We tend to interact with that notion in the Christian context as being saint so-and-so. Three or four hundred years after the beginning of the early church, this process gets started where people, after they have died, if they've lived these rather extraordinary lives, they get canonized by the church, and then they're not just Patrick of Ireland, now they're Saint Patrick of Ireland. And so we, we think in those terms of these people who live extraordinary lives and they've reached this certain kind of perfection. That's who a saint is. That's not how the New Testament talks about saints. Saints are simply people who belong to Jesus Christ whose lives are being transformed by Him. That can be every single one of us inside of this room. So he's speaking to the saints who are in Colorado Springs, the saints who are in Living Hope Church. Now, I know a lot of you, and I may or may not call you saint, but that's a whole other thing, right? Right? Saints are people who are called to live in the sphere of God's will, in the sphere of God's power, who are called to live inside of his kingdom. Saints are people who are pointed in a different direction from the rest of the world and who are becoming witnesses to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Saints are people who live in such a way that we are now bearing witness to the life that's possible in Jesus Christ instead of every other life that is available to us. So in Ephesians 4.17, Paul says this, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. The way they think is futile. That way of life is empty. So don't walk that way anymore. Live a different life. We're 
saints in Jesus Christ. Now, he speaks that to these Ephesians early on in the life of the church, and he's asking them to live different kinds of lives. But this question presses itself upon us as we read a book like this. How does that kind of difference manifest itself now? How is the life of Jesus Christ different now as opposed to the way the world says life should be lived? And this is part of the job of the church is to figure that out and actually live that out, learn how to teach each other to do that. How important is it for the modern church to find this different way of life and actually bear witness to it? See, we are saints. Are we really? (laughs) Are we actually walking in the way of Jesus Christ as Paul calls us to do it? So he writes to the saints who were in Ephesus and probably the region around. He says, those who are faithful in Christ Jesus. So he speaks to Christians that he considers faithful. They have endured. They have stuck with the faith. They have stuck with Jesus through some very difficult times. So saints are people who endure in our commitment to Jesus Christ, even when the world makes it difficult or complicated, or even when it takes some time to figure out what that means. Saints are people who endure in the way of Jesus Christ. Now, the original Ephesian church, their lives changed so dramatically, so quickly. Now, remember, Paul is only there for two or three years. There was a church there before he got there. He's there for two or three years. But that early church, even in just its first few years, changed so radically, they actually affected the economy of a major metropolitan city. Now, again, you can read all of this in Acts 19 and 20, but we're going to read a little chunk of it people griping about how Christians live, okay? I'm calling thunder down a little bit later on just so you guys know. In Acts chapter 19, here's how part of this story goes. At that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way, meaning Christians. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen or a lot of business and money to the craftsmen. These, the craftsmen, he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger Not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. Let's translate that just a little bit. Demetrius is the head of the silversmith guild. He's the head of their local union. And he says because of this giant temple to Artemis or Diana, and there really was this colossal temple to the goddess Artemis in ancient Ephesus. And he says because of what's happening, we're actually losing money. And and she's actually being deposed from her greatness. You see, if you are going to visit Ephesus or visit that temple to make a sacrifice, to ask the goddess Artemis to do something for you, you would, along the way, you would visit these shops and you would buy these little idols, the silversmith idols, the wooden idols, the stone-carved idols. You would buy these things as part of your sacrifice to Diana. So the more people who attend the temple to Artemis the greater the wealth is for Demetrius and the silversmiths and all the other guilds that are at work there because of the temple. But if attendance to the temple goes down, what also goes down? Their trade, their money, what they sell. So that's what Demetrius says. Paul has persuaded so many people that Diana is no longer a goddess that I'm losing money. And here's what happens next. He starts a riot. The riot in the streets gets so great that they have to actually dump themselves into the local college football stadium. That's that's what it was like. This giant local amphitheater, and it fills with people, and they begin to drag Christians in the middle to answer for their antisocial behavior. And I'll let you read Acts 19 and what Paul does and what the church does and what comes of all of that. 
But you see, Christians quit spending money because, in a certain way because they became Christians. They quit believing that false gods were true. They quit believing that falsehoods were true, and they began to believe that only God is God. So they're actually pulled into the public square to answer for what the rest of the world considered antisocial behavior, but they didn't stop doing it. So Paul writes to faithful saints who were in Ephesus. Guys, what in our economy would change? What in our economy would change if Christians began to spend money as if Christ really were Lord? What in our economy would change? What in our social structure would change? Who would get grumpy if we started handling our money differently than we do? What about our Christian belief? Does our culture make hard to live out? Paul says we're saints, we're living a different life. But he also calls us faithful. We're called to endure, to live as if this really is true. Grace to you from God our Father and peace from our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is praying for the life of God to be alive in the hearts and the minds of all of these Christians. We'll have plenty of time in this book to talk about God's gift, grace. May God's gift, he said, all of it be alive inside of you. May God's full-bodied well-being at work be at work inside of your lives. It's a beautiful prayer. And then he says this, blessed be, and that little phrase just simply means all praise be, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. No praise to any other God contender. None of that. All praise be to God our Father. No more praise or adoration to any other idol we used to worship or any other idol that contends with God for this place inside of our lives. And God has given us every spiritual blessing, it says, everything we need. And He has given us what only the Creator of our souls can actually give us, every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. You see, for Paul, when he uses his phrase spiritual blessing, and he'll use similar phrases throughout the book a few times, a spiritual blessing, again, is not one that's just sort of fuzzy around the edges and makes us feel nice. It is one that is full of the Spirit of God. It is full of the Spirit of God. You see, what God gives us is not the same kinds of things this world gives us. It has a completely different source, and it has a completely different power, and it has a completely different life attached to it. What God gives to those who love Him actually changes what the world does to us. Only God can give these kinds of gifts. So much. Now, here's, if, if you go home and you begin reading through Ephesians, and you get to 4, 5, and 6, so much of what Paul's talking about, what this new life is, is how God is fixing what the world has done to us. How God is putting back together what the world breaks in us. These are spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Everything that we need comes from God. And Paul will absolutely make it clear in this book that we live in contested territory. This world, our lives, this is contested territory. Our enemy, a very real spiritual force, is at work shaping our daily lives to lead us away from the things of Christ. So it's important for us to be aware of that and to live in the things of God instead. So all of these gifts, these spiritual blessings that God gives, these are like divine beachheads inside of our lives where the power and the will of God actually begins its work within us. It's actually beautiful and powerful stuff, guys, what God is doing. And so we ask ourselves, are we ready to be formed and shaped by the things of God, to become the kind of people that God has called called us to be, to be the kind of people who are living out the unfolding of the mystery of the gospel in the things of Jesus Christ. What lays before us, friends, is a powerful story of who God is and what a transformed life really can look like. Let's pray.